Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to the session. So I'm Asanka Bevira from the integration team. And I'm going to talk about how you can up-level uh, your brown print integration. So this is the agenda for the talk. So I'll first introduce what is brownfield integration, and then let's have a look at why do we need brownfield integration in the modern enterprise, and then what are the common problems uh, we face when we are going to do brownfield integration, and then how you can use enterprise integrator to solve those integration problems. So let's first define some terminologies. So according to Wikipedia, a greenfield project is developing a system uh, for a totally new environment without concerns for integrating with other systems. So the main, main thing to focus here is that we don't concern much about integrating with other systems. So this is very attractive to uh, developers and architects because you, don't, you, you have the freedom to pick your technology and the protocol. And so, so this is uh, very ideal and we, people like to choose. But the problem is, even though we like it, sometimes we can't do it. So brownfield project is completely the opposite of greenfield project. So I, I would say it's something like this. So you have your monolithic application in the background and it is making money for the business and it's, it's reliable. But, but everyone knows that it's, it's a bit old and it's, uh, it's not very efficient in the modern terms. And, and, and we can't continue into the future with that. So we have to transform, transform the business uh, to match the new requirements. So, so like in the picture, uh, a, a, a developer has started working on the new version. And then, but we don't have much resources. We, can't, we, we, we don't have all the money in the world, so we have limited resources. And, and when we are doing a development like that, we will have to match the existing monolithic application. Like, like in this picture, we have to even uh, match the bricks that they have used and, and the uh, pipelines, everything we have to match. So, so in, in, in uh, the enterprise architecture, in, in the enterprise architecture sense, this is a bit of limiting the technologies of the protocols that you can use in your, in, in your enterprise. And then developers and architects tend to uh, dislike this when compared with the integration. And even Ch in the Tanaka's talk, he told that the greenfield project is not for enterprise. So in this talk, I'm going to tell about how you can do a brownfield project like a greenfield project. That is, having the freedom to pick your technology and the protocols, you can do a brownfield project. So in a typical enterprise architect, you, you will have hundreds of systems uh, which use different technologies and different protocols that is used, within, used for day-to-day -day business activities. And, and when you are transforming, when you are digitally transforming the business, you need those different systems to talk together to, to be used in the new applications and, and to be more efficient. But, uh, and, and one way you can do that is by uh, doing a greenfield project, like, like implementing all those systems to use a common technology and a protocol so that they integrate nicely together. But most of the cases, the reward you get from rewriting and replacing all the existing system is less than the cost you have to bear. So it's inevitable to do uh, a greenfield project from a business point of view. And then, then when you think about time, you can't do it overnight or within a week. You will have to wait years to complete and the businesses cannot wait for 10 or 20 years. You have to be productive right now. And then, uh, and most of, uh, some of the systems you cannot replace, you have to live with them. So this is why it is very important to have brownfield integration in the enterprise. So let's have a look at what are the systems that we see in a typical brownfield uh, architecture. So, so I, I, 
I, I am defining a computer system as something that takes an input and, and uh, give an output and sometimes these uses uh, storage to keep the state. And so we have systems that use standard protocols like uh, HTTP, JMS, and then the, typically these systems are easy to integrate and, and these systems you can even use products like API Manage and also stuff to have capabilities. Uh, but when you talk about uh, non-standard, uh, the systems that use non-standard and proprietary protocols, it is a little bit uh, harder than the standard ones, but if, if they are commonly used, still it's okay. And then the, we have legacy systems which are using file files as a, for processing, uh, as inputs and outputs. And then finally we have the systems which are not meant to be integrated rather than uh, which are doing its processing individually, and, but we still need to integrate with them. So if they are using a storage mechanism or a database, we still can integrate with them. So let's say now you are doing a new development and you are developing a new system and you want to integrate with the existing, uh, infra existing systems, but still you want to do the integration like a greenfield, like you want to pick your technology and you want to pick your protocol and everything. So when, when, when we try to do that, uh, we will come up with these requirements still since we still we want to integrate with the existing system i'll go through one by them one by one and first we have a we have the transformation requirement let's say now we are we are building our system and our new system is in the left hand side and and we want to integrate with the existing system which is in the right hand side and and let's say luckily we the the new system is also using a protocol like http and the, the existing system also using a protocol like, uh, like HTTP. But still, if the messaging format is different, like if the new system is using JSON and the existing system is using uh, XML, we still need to do some transformation. So now, uh, if we have some, something in the middle which can do the transformation for us, we can still do our new system in a greenfield manner. So this is the first re requirement. And the second one is, there could be some property that we have to look at when we call to different systems. Like, it might be, even it, it can be time. So depending on the time of the day, you, ha you might have to call a different system. Or it could be a header or some something like that. So, so this is the re second requirement. When you receive a message, uh, when you want to send a message, you have to check and send it to the matching endpoint. And the third requirement is service orchestration. The orchestration is like, so, so if, you, if, you have, if you have gone to take a driving license or something, that you have seen that you have to go to that count and take something and then go to the next count and take something. So this requirement is also there in the, we can found this in the enterprise as well. So there could be a system A, system B, system C, which we need to go in order. Like go to system A and then, and then uh, take the response from the system A and then go to system B and then take the response and do some processing and go to system C and finally respond to the client. So even in this case, so the new system, we don't want to handle that complexity. We want to write it in a clean manner and without caring about the other systems. And for that to happen, we have to have uh, something in the middle that do the orchestration for us. And then, when, when, we, when we take two systems, since we are picking our own protocol, there could, the other system that we want to talk can be using a completely different language. So in, in this scenario, we will have to convert between those, those two protocols. This one also, so this is, also requiring uh, some, something in the middle that do the conversion. And this is not a, actually a functional requirement, this is a non-functional requirement, which is mainly used to reduce the latencies between the request and the response. So here we have two systems which we can call parallelly, like, like we, if you want to take quotations from two systems, we can call them parallelly and respond back to the client. 
in this scenario, so if you use a processing model like this, the latency will be the maximum latency of all the systems. But if you do it synchronously, it will be the sum of the latencies. So, so uh, pros parallel processing is very important when you want to improve the performance and reduce latency. So that's, that's the main requirement that I'm going to talk about. And let's, uh, before going into how you can use Enterprise Integrator to solve all these problems, I'll introduce Enterprise Integrator to you and then go how we can use the Enterprise Integrator to solve these, all these problems. So when, when, we have, when, we are, when we have developed integration platforms with the customers, we have seen that they are using several servers together to achieve that. So typically we, we have seen uh, the Enterprise Service Bus which is used as a central event, uh, central service bus to control the control complete uh, integration. And then uh, the message broker is used as a messaging middleware to do all, uh, to, for, to cater for all the messaging requirements. And then the data services server, which is used as, uh, used to expose data sources as services. And then business process server, which, which is normally used to expose, to, to integrate services in a stateful manner. So, so when we, so it, it made sense for us to repackage them in a single product so that the customers have less trouble in downloading several things and they can just use this package to uh, implement the complete platform. So, this is the high level, you can consider this as the high level uh, overview of the enterprise integrator. So you have the capability to integrate with cloud services, uh, on-premise applications, and then data sources, proprietary systems, and, and even with files. And you can think that the enterprise integrator has these capabilities when you integrate. So you have the data integration capabilities, uh, service integration capabilities and business process processing capabilities and messaging capabilities. And you also have the analytics and tool, tooling capability which is also useful in developing an integration platform. And so, it's, uh, so we shouldn't think that enterprise integrator as a single runtime which provide all these functionalities. Rather we should think it as a packaging of several uh, runtimes that you can use in an integration platform. So we have an ESB and DSS as a single runtime. So during the, uh, the session integration solutions that we, we developed for customers, we have seen that the, they are installing DSS features in ESB and using it as a single runtime. So even for us, it made sense to package them as a single runtime so that, that they can use it as a single runtime. And then business process server, message broker, and EI analytics, we have packaged them as different runtimes. And then we have a new addition to the EI in the 6.3 release, which we call as micro integrator, which is a very lightweight, container-friendly runtime which you can use with your microservices architectures. So I'll, I'll explain a bit about those runtimes. Uh, so we have the integration runtime which, which, which has the service integration capabilities. So, so in the integration runtime, we, have, we are using an ESP-like component, which is a lightweight, high-performance service bus based on the Apache Synapse. And it supports a wide range of features, and it also supports in industry standard protocols like uh, uh, HTTP, JMS, and stuff like that. And even the non-standards like SAP are supported out of the box. And you can even extend, so, so we can't cover all the, uh, stand, all the protocols and the technologies in the world, so we have made it extensible. So you can write your own extensions and, and that makes Enterprise Integrator virtually uh, integrate with everything in the world. And you can also, uh, so it, it, has, it, it covers all the EIP patterns that, that is there that, so that the architects can develop with freedom. 
And so we also have the data integration capabilities in the integration runtime. So you can expose your relational databases or non-relational databases as services to the outside. So you can, you can even use uh, MySQL, MSSQL-like databases, and then non-relational non, uh, databases like MongoDB, Cassandra. And then even you can use, you can expose data in files like Microsoft Excel and Google Sheets as services using the data services server. Uh, then we have the business process runtime. So in, in the integrator runtime, it's normally it is stateless services. But there are, sometimes we need to do a stateful, long-running service integrations. And sometimes we need to have humans involved in the uh, process as well. For that purpose, we have the business process service uh, business process service runtime, uh, which, which supports all the, uh, the main standard protocols like uh, BPL, BPMN, and, and you, you have the tooling support as well. And then we have the message brokering runtime, which is to, which is to cover the messaging, messaging, uh, messaging middleware requirements. And then this, uh, this is the only open source distributed messaging broking, brokering server that you can use in the world. And then it, it supports standard protocols like JMS and MQP. And for message persistence using uh, RDBMS, so you can easily integrate it with your existing system. And so I think Chanaka talked a lot, lot about the microservices architecture and all those stuff. So, so in the, uh, so we have atomic services and composite services in a typical microservices architecture. So atomic services is a very fine grain uh, are services which are targeted for a specific task. And then the composite services are the services which combine several those uh, atomic services and create a composite service. So even though the integrator has the capability to do composition, the startup time was very high, so it didn't suit the microservices architecture. So there, therefore, we focused on reducing the startup time so that we can match, so we can use the micro integrator in a microservices architecture. So while doing that, we were able to re even reduce the distribu uh, distribution size, and, and we, we were able to do it without dropping any uh, features that were there re that is required for compos composing services. So this is a basic comparison of the two profiles. So earlier the integrator profile startup time was around 40 seconds. Now we, we were able to reduce it to five seconds in the mi micro integrator profile. And the distribution size was reduced more than half. And, and we we had to remove the, we, we, we removed clustering, uh, deployment synchronization, management console, multi-tenancy, and hot deployment requirements, which is not required in a microservices architecture. And, if, and all the mediation and data integration features are there so that you can use the tooling, so whatever the things that you use today, you can use it to develop carbon applications and you can deploy those carbon applications in the micro integrate and use. So now, since we, have, we know we have a good understanding about the integration integrator, let's look at how we can use the WCO2 enterprise integrator to solve those, those functionality requirements that I talked earlier. So in, uh, in the integrator, we, we call the unit of message processing uh, as a mediator, and ESB has uh, support for several mediators, and I'll be talking about the mediators that we can use to do the message transformation. So when you are doing a transformation, there is two things that you need to do. You first have to understand the message type. So you need to understand if it is an XML message or a JSON message, and then you need to do the transformation, and then you need to send the message out. So to understand in message size, message type, you have message formatters and message builders which you can use and the standard uh, message types like uh, CSV, XMLs, as support is 
they are in the vanilla pack. And if you want to support uh, custom data message types, you can write your own. And so, so when you understand the message type, you have to do the message transformation. For that, you have these four basic mediators which you can use. So the data member mediator is, uh, you, have, you can do it visually. So I'll, I'll show you the, uh, so it, it will it look like this. So you can have your input in the left hand side and the output in the right hand side and you can do a mapping between the different, different payloads and you can even do small mediations like uh, appending, uh, incrementing a value, some things like that you can do with, with that tool. And then you have the enrich, med enrich mediator which you can use to partially modify your message. Like you don't want to uh, fix fix the complete message, but you have to just add a some some small amount, small part to the existing message. You can use enrich mediator. Then you have the payload factory mediator, which you can use to define the complete payload and have some elements which you need to be you need to parameterized. So you can have uh, some XPath or something to fill that value up. And then if that is not enough, you can use the XSLT mediator, which you can use with XSLT files to process the incoming message and transform it to the required message. And for the routing requirements, uh, there are a couple of mediators available in the ESP. So no, typically when we want to route a message, we either look at the content of the message or a header of the message or a property property of the message or some environment property of the message. So when you, are, when, you, when you want to route to different endpoints, you can use switch mediator, which is like a switch case construct in a programming language. And so you have a variable and you can check it with multiple values and depending on, on the value, you can route to a destination. And then you have the filter mediator, which acts like a uh, if else construct in a programming language, so you can just check and if it is true, you can send to the system A and if it is false, you can send to the system B. And then for orchestration, uh, we have a mediator called call mediator. So, you, so the call mediator is synchronous for a user. You can think of it as a synchronous mediator which calls, which you can use to call a system, uh, a system A and then get the response and then you can call the system B and then call system C like likewise. But internally, it is designed, it is implemented as an asynchronous non-blocking manner. So that's like, so, so the thread that is used to execute this path never get blocked. So that you can use the CPU resources very efficiently when you use this. And then we have the protocol switching requirement. So in, in the integrator, we use transport listeners and senders to receive and send messages. And the ES ESB has a lot of uh, transport senders and listeners out of the box. Uh, like you can easily use HTTP and JMS and, and so many protocols are supported there. But and and if you want, if you are using any proprietary or non-standard protocol then you, you have the capability to write your own transport listener and plug it into the ESB so that, that you can convert from that newly implemented protocol to any, any of the protocols that is already supported in the ESP. And so that was the requirement. So I also talked about different types of systems in a brownfield and let's have a look at the support from the enterprise integrator for the, all, all those systems. So typically in an environment, you have, we, have, we, we, we have seen people using these, uh, these type of protocols like HTTP and HTTPS for web-based APIs and, and JMS, MQP, uh, MQTT, Kafka for messaging requirements and, and protocols like FTP, SFTP for file processing. So all, so in, enterprise integrator has the built-in support for all these protocols and, and there are many more protocols that you can see, you can visit the product page to see the complete list. And so this is a typical uh, scenario that you, you can achieve using the built-in support with the standard uh, 
protocols. So let's say that you have an existing system which uses FTP, and so your new application is using HTTP. So you want to expose the FTP service using HTTP. So you can use the enterprise integrator and configure a FTP endpoint and expo expose that FTP endpoint as a HTTP service. And when we talk about non-standard or proprietary protocols, even for non-standard proprietary protocols, we have built-in support for some of the commonly used ones, like SAP. And this is how it will typically look like, a, typ a typical use case will look like. So you will have the existing system which, ha which use non-standard protocols and you have your new system. And your new system, you don't want to implement whatever the protocol that is used by the non-standard protocol. So what you can do is you can have a look at if there is, if there is an existing uh, connector or something, ex existing component that you can use in the ESB. If not, you can implement your own and install it in the ESB so that now you have the, the enterprise integrator has the capability to talk with the existing system which uses non-standard protocol and, and then you can configure that, configure an HTTP or HTTP or API which can use that connector to talk with the, the existing system. So, so when, you are, when you want to extend, uh, when you want to add support like that, there are several places that you can write extensions. So this is uh, the, the architecture of the enterprise integrator. So we have a layered architecture and there are several places that you can plug your own extension. So this is the complete list of the extensions that you can, you can write. So for this talk, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna focus only on the connectors. So connector is some add-on that you can install in the enterprise integrator and, and which, which adds the capability to talk to third party services like uh, Twitter, Jira, Salesforce, stuff like that. So typically when we talk about a third part system, we either get a web API which we can use to the third party or, or we get an SDK which we can write a program to talk to that system. So, so you can use those uh, SDKs or APIs to implement your connector and that connector will have the capability to, uh, the, that will add the capability to, inter to integrate, integrate to talk to the third party system. And we have around, we have more than 150 ready-made connectors which you can use and you can search all those stuff from the WSO2 connectors, connector store. And then we have the legacy file-based system. So enterprise integrator comes with, comes with the support for in standard protocols like uh, it's the file transferring protocols like FTP, SFTP and uh, SMB stuff like that. So you can easily uh, convert any of the file-based systems to you be used by a HTTP endpoint or something like that. So this is a typical example where we have convert, we, we, have, we have exposed uh, a file-based system to a web API. So let's say now you have developed the, the, this new system and you want to, uh, you want events from a file processing system. The, the existing system, what it does is it, it do some processing from a user input or something, and but but as the output, it generates files, and you want your web API to consume those messages. So what we can do is we can have an enterprise integrator looking at a directory for a specific file extensions, and whenever the the legacy system put a file to that directory, the integrator will read that file and do the necessary transformation and and call the the new, newly implemented web API, which, which you will use then use to process, further process that, that uh, file. And this is another example. So in the early example, we were listening for file, file changes. In this example, we, we can do the change, the file changes from, from the request that we received to the enterprise integrator. So here we, in the enterprise integrator, we have a connector called file connector which you can do, which, which you can use to do file manipulation operations like uh, file uh, content appending, moving, copying, stuff like that. So, 
So you can configure the file connector in the enterprise integrated and implement a HTTP service so that when you receive a request to that service, you, the enterprise integrator can do the file operations and that will affect the existing system which use those files to do its processing. And then finally the system which, which does not provide much integration but, but they internally use data sources or, or and storage, and me storage mechanisms to store its states but, but our new application wants to that, in, that, uh, that existing system. So what we can do is we can use the data integration capabilities in the enterprise integrator and configure it to have to, to expose that data service, data source as a data service and then in the enterprise integrator we can use that data service and do our compositions and then expose that as a service to the outside. So in, in conclusion, uh, so I explain what is an brownfield integration and uh, why it is important to have important to do the brownfield integration in an enterprise and then what are the common problems that you face when doing a brownfield integration and then how you can use the enterprise integrator to solve all these problems. Uh, that's all from me, thank you. And